The Hunger Games prequel we have all been waiting for is finally here, and I think the ending left a lot of people with questions. So I'm going to go through the film's ending, reference the novel it's based on, and break down the entire climax. Obviously there will be spoilers in this video, but I assume if you clicked on it then you probably knew that. If you like this video, hit that like button, it will greatly help the channel with the algorithm. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button, and you can also follow me on all of my socials, all of which are linked down below, and all of which house similar content that I make here on this channel. Now that I've said that, let's break down the ending. Snow and Lucy Gray deciding to go on the run is, I think, where the ending really starts, both leaving behind something. Snow gives up the chance to make it back to the capital, and Lucy Gray leaves behind the covey. The book also mentioned that both of them left behind a dream, Snow giving up his ambition to become president, and Lucy Gray giving up singing as she left her guitar behind. As they walk, they talk about good and evil. There's a natural goodness built into us all. We can step across that line into evil or not. Snow slips up, saying that killing three people was too many, which immediately throws Lucy Gray off because she only knew about two of them, the boy in the arena Bobbin and the mayor's daughter Mayfair, not knowing about Sejanus. Snow tries to recover though, saying that he killed himself when he decided to come with her. This is really important because Snow was already lying to Lucy Gray minutes into starting their new life together, showing that he feels as though he can't trust her. At this point in the novel, he questions what life will be without aspiring to wealth, fame, and power, the only thing he's known his whole life. Furthermore, in the book, Snow thinks to himself that he's too exceptional for a life like this, digging for worms and working to catch their food, and he notes that society is losing out with him leaving. Then, he finds the murder weapons that would have incriminated him, and he sees a way out of this new life with Lucy Gray that he's heavily doubting. In the movie, Lucy Gray mentions to Snow that she's a loose end, which is interesting because she didn't say that in the book. Lucy Gray then goes out to dig for the plant Katniss, and this moment is monumental because while she goes to do that, Snow thinks of Lucy Gray as a complication, foreshadowing the complication that Katniss Everdeen will once be on him many years in the future. One thing to note when looking at the source material is at this point in the novel, Snow thinks that he and Lucy Gray can go back knowing that she loved him. He still wanted her in his life, but didn't want the life they were currently embarking on. He felt that he was too good for this life. Snow goes looking for Lucy Gray, and there's a very important detail. The fact that he went out armed with a gun. This is the first big sign of his mistrust for Lucy Gray, because he felt as though he needed a weapon for protection from her. When he goes looking for Lucy Gray though, she's nowhere to be found, and not being able to find her makes Coriolanus spiral. In the book, he thinks about how Lucy Gray killed in the arena, and he assumes that she must have figured out that he killed Sejanus, and now thinks he'll kill her as well. Which is reasonable, considering the fact that he went out there armed with a gun. Even with that mistrust in her though, in the novel, Snow thinks to himself that he just needs her to see sense, and he's desperate to talk to her, still hoping that she could be part of his life. However, he then starts to realize how much Lucy Gray could have ruined his life. This is because she knew that he murdered Mayfair, and on top of that, she could tarnish his reputation if it got out that he cheated in the Hunger Games. After tracking Lucy Gray to the scarf he gave her that used to belong to his mother, a snake pops out and bites him. This is where it's up for interpretation. Lucy Gray might have put that snake there, but she might not have at the same time. If she didn't plant the snake there, this reflects Snow's paranoia, and if she did plant it there, this shows that Snow underestimated Lucy Gray, and she's more powerful than he ever expected her to be. Either way, this is where all hell breaks loose, as Snow arms himself with the rifle, convinced now that she's just as ruthless and violent as he can be, and that changes everything. In the book, Suzanne Collins said that this was the start of their own private Hunger Games. Before going after her in the movie, Coriolanus smells the scarf, which still smells like roses, the scent he associated with his mother, an interesting detail that was not in the book. In the movie, Snow clearly sees Lucy Gray and shoots in that direction. As he approaches the spot where she would have been though, she's nowhere to be found as he finds only an earring she was wearing. Lucy Gray then starts singing the first verse of The Hanging Tree, and it's super interesting that the pairing of the Mockingjay and the Hanging Tree song are what throws Snow off, because those two things are part of what would be his ultimate downfall decades later, as Katniss was the Mockingjay that sang The Hanging Tree song. Also, Lucy Gray singing this verse now applies to Snow himself, who murdered three people. 
Snow then desperately fires in all directions to kill the Jabberjays and just hoping that one of those bullets would get Lucy Gray as well. And you have to remember that at this point, Snow was injured from the snake bite, which throws his senses off. He's just barely able to sink the murder weapons into the lake to hide his crimes and head back to the base. So what happened to Lucy Gray? Well, it's up for the audience to decide, but there are three possibilities. One, she got away and continued up north to live the rest of her life. Two, she went back to District 12, and there she would be murdered by the mayor, payback for the death of his daughter Mayfair. Or three, she died in the forest from one of Snow's bullets. If that's the case, it's chilling, because that forest was Katniss's escape, first with her father and then with Gail. To think that her greatest enemy once killed someone in these woods, a victim that held the exact same place that she did as the female District 12 tribute in the Hunger Games is quite disturbing. Later on, Snow plans to go to District 2 to become an officer, but instead gets taken to the capital, and this is where his dark path really manifests, all thanks to the person who saved him, Dr. Gall. Upon his arrival, she treats him like a student, as though he never left the classroom, showing that everything Snow went through in District 12 as a peacekeeper was Gall testing him while simultaneously teaching him. She asks him the same question she asked him at the beginning of the film. Let me ask you one final time. What are the Hunger Games for? And this time, Snow gives the answer she wanted to hear. In the movie, he said that the games were created to remind them of who they are, and who they are are victors. However, this is actually a different answer than he gave in the book. There, he said that they are part of an eternal war, and the games let the capital control the war and win. And he adds that the games remind people of who they are, creatures who need the capital to survive. I thought this was an interesting change from book to movie, but when you really think about it, it's pretty much saying the same thing, one is just shortened to make the time of the movie go down. And speaking of cutting the movie down, there are a few details from this conversation that the film skipped over that I'm going to go over here. As the scene goes on, we see how much the 10th Hunger Games influenced the games moving forward. Gull says that they're deleting every copy of that year's Hunger Games, which pleases Snow, thinking that everyone, including himself, would forget about Lucy Gray. And they benefited from the fact that the district citizens didn't really watch the games, meaning she would be forgotten even faster. Moving forward though, Gull says that Lucky Flickerman will stay, Snow's idea from earlier which was betting on the event will stay, and Snow mentions another idea he has, saying that they need to make it mandatory for the district citizens to watch the games moving forward. Gull is incredibly pleased with this, and in both the book and the movie, she tells him that he'll be studying under her at university. This of course leads to Gall forming the monster Snow would later become, a process that's already been started, as this Snow is unrecognizable from the Coriolanus we met at the beginning of the movie. In the book, this was perfectly represented by the fact that from then on, he would go by his last name Snow rather than his first name Coriolanus. Another few details that the movie cut was that after a few months of studying under Gaul, Snow gets an internship with Game Makers, and they take many of his suggestions, like giving food to everyone in the Winning Tribute's district, as well as a house to the Winning Tribute and their family, increasing engagement, and making it more appealing for the Tribute to win. All of this encourages people to get involved, especially with the betting, which simultaneously pushes away questions like, are the games ethical in the first place? Snow also benefits from the Plinth family, which is another thing that shows how sick and twisted he has become. After killing their son, he allows Strabo Plinth and his wife to pamper him, thinking that he was their son's savior. In the book, he feels no guilt when they buy Snow's apartment after they were evicted, which by the way was another detail that the movie skipped over. The movie did mention that he becomes the heir to the Plinth's fortune though, meaning he would eventually get all of their wealth when they died, which would be the base of him furthering his political career. The book goes over his feelings on this, and it's an interesting outlook. He still views Strabo Plinth as beneath him because he's from the districts, meaning Snow just uses him to further his career. To Snow, Strabo is a tool, not a person. Before leaving his apartment, Tigris tells Snow that he looks just like his father, showing that he's going down the same path as his corrupted dad. The same idea was shown differently in the book though. While he was in District 12, Coriolanus unloaded his pockets, and here, he symbolically chooses his new path. He discards his mother's powder container, as well as his mother's family photos, symbolizing him letting go of the good person in him. And meanwhile, he decides to keep the compass from his father, which we saw him get at the beginning of the movie, showing that he chose the path of his evil father rather than his good-natured mother. 
When Snow visits Dean Casca Highbottom's office, we learn the truth about how the Hunger Games were started. A drunk Highbottom had written a paper for Dr. Gall answering the question of how to create a punishment for an enemy that would make them never forget their crimes, and he came up with the Hunger Games. Then, crass as Snow, Corey and Lannis' father turned that paper into Gall without Highbottom's permission, and she took that and ran with it. This then explains why Casca Highbottom hates Coriolanus so much. It was because he had never forgiven his father Crassus for turning his paper in. And now years later, Coriolanus kept his father's legacy going, because just when Highbottom thought he would be able to stop the games as people were losing interest, Snow came up with a ton of ideas like betting and prizes for the winner which made the games more popular than ever. This backstory for Highbottom, one of extreme guilt and resentment, also reveals why he's so addicted to Morphling. He started taking it to numb himself after Gaul began the Hunger Games, and he hasn't stopped since. The movie cut a bit from this scene as well, as Snow gets Highbottom riled up, saying that the games support Gaul's view on humanity. She uses children because they're innocent, and when children become killers, it proves that humans are naturally violent. A riled up Highbottom tries to get back at Snow by mentioning Lucy Gray, but in the movie, Snow simply brushes this off. We know from the source material though, that deep down, this did bother him. Highbottom then says that people think the mayor of District 12 killed Lucy Gray, thinking that she was the one who killed his daughter, a crime that was actually committed by Snow himself. And the final thing that I'll say on Lucy Gray's death, going back to the song that she sang to Coriolanus by the lake, the song that was about her, in the book, Snow thinks to himself that the real-life Lucy Gray is now the Lucy Gray from the song a ghost. But he thinks that she's gone and she can't hurt him. She can't expose his secrets or tell of his crimes. This of course leaves something up for interpretation though, that Katniss Everdeen is the second coming of this ghost of Lucy Gray and she can hurt him. This is even more prevalent as you think back to the last thing that Lucy Gray was doing, picking Katniss. Going back to the interaction with Highbottom though, this is the final thing that makes Coriolanus ascend into the monster of Snow, the man we knew him as during the original series. The movie skipped over this, but he had picked up a pinch of rat poison from an alley on the way to see Highbottom, and he put this into Janus' Morphling bottle, always planning to leave it with Highbottom, knowing that the addict in Highbottom could not resist it. After Snow left, he of course took the bait, and this poisoned him, which was brilliantly shown in the movie by the bloody nose he got, the exact same bloody nose the tributes who were exposed to rat poison got in the arena. This was the first of many poisons, and Snow would do this for decades. Anyone who got in his way on his rise to power, he would just poison, a trick he had learned from Lucy Gray while she was in the arena. This also shows that Snow no longer feels any remorse, and he doesn't value human life the way he did at the beginning of the movie. Earlier in the film, he was vouching for the tributes, saying that they were human and should be treated as humans. Those tributes don't have a choice. Now, however, he's tipped over into the realm of true evil. As the film closes, Coriolanus says that Snow lands on top, which in the book, he hoped would be Highbottom's last thoughts before he died. After the screen goes black, we hear a line from Donald Sutherland who played Snow in the original series. It's the things we love most that destroy us. And this is actually a line taken from Mockingjay Part 1 as he said this to Katniss. It's pretty interesting how true this quote resides for his backstory and his arc in this movie. The book had a few other details that the movie left out that I might as well just go over because it does add a lot to his story. Most of this is about how Snow continued on. He went on to marry Livia Cardew, one of the Academy students who was also chosen to mentor a tribute for the 10th Hunger Games. He married her not out of attraction though, but rather because he knew he would never love her. This is important because he realized how weak love made him with Lucy Gray and he never wanted to have that disadvantage again. And that's the ending of Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes fully explained, both for the movie and the book, really. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of the ending, and just overall what you thought of the movie. I'm excited to read your guys' thoughts. That's all I have for you guys today, though, so I will see you in the next video. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life, like my cute dog, Loki, and some behind-the-scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me, and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.